What if it's 2022 and I need, let's call it $100,000 to sustain my lifestyle, but my stocks went down. So I'm actually drawing I'm, and I'm hurting my position because I need $100,000 to live, but my stocks are down. Like, so that, that math and playing that game year in and year out, I didn't like it. This show is dedicated to helping you strengthen your family tree and live financially free. Welcome to the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, everybody. This is Andy Hill, and today we're talking about the importance of saving and investing when your income grows. In our careers or business ventures, we may come across a huge windfall. That might be a big commission from a sales job or a bonus for an incredible year or just a series of years where we're paid handsomely for our work. And we have a choice with that windfall time in our lives. We can spend most all of it and live lavishly for a period of time, or we can save and invest a large portion of it knowing that these days may not always be here. So to help us discover the importance of saving and investing when our income grows, I've invited author Devon Kennard on the show today. Devon is an NFL linebacker, investor, and philanthropist. Over the last decade, he's developed into a savvy real estate investor, amassing a multi-million dollar portfolio, all while playing in the NFL. He's also the author of the new book, It All Adds Up, Designing Your Game Plan for Financial success. When he's not inspiring others to use their active income to create passive income, he's spending time with his wife, Camille, and his two daughters. Welcome to the show, Devon. Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure. Awesome, man. Well, it's great to have you here. And I know that you've got a great history when it comes to the NFL, as well as growing your own business and real estate. So let's dive into that. Your father, he played in the NFL as well. Did that early exposure to what an NFL career is like and how it doesn't sort of last forever, did that shape your views of money and financial freedom? Well, yeah, because growing up, I hit my dad's last year in the NFL when I was like four and five years old. So most of my upbringing was his life post NFL. So I got to see what that looked like and made me realize as years went on and on that you spend so much time outside of the NFL and you have so much life ahead of you. So it kind of forced me naturally to pay attention to that because I'm like, you know, my dad played 13 years, which is a ridiculously long time to play in the NFL. And he still had all this life to live once he was done. So it it kind of was ingrained into me at a young age, like, all right, well, football is going to end one day. I'm seeing it right in front of uh, in front of me. So let me plan for that and what that's going to look like. That's awesome. Well, walk us through the beginning portions of your of your career in the NFL. Where did you start? And then like, how much did you start earning? And was was this a big surprise to you as, as a young man getting all this money? Well, I think it starts back in college. I went to the University of Southern California and I was a top recruit out of high school, had scholarships to go anywhere in the country. But when I was in college, I started to face a lot of injuries and position changes. And I was going through a lot of adversity. You know, it made it unlikely. There was reports like, is Devon Kennard ever going to make it to the NFL and things like that? And I ended up having a really good redshirt senior year. I ended up with nine and a half sacks. I, I played really well. And I had a, and I put myself in a position to get drafted. But I was still drafted late. I was uh, the bottom of the fifth round, uh, pick 174. I'll never forget it. And, you know, now I'm getting in the NFL, but I don't know how long or what my future is going to look like. So there was some guarantees, but I think my signing bonus was like a hundred and something thousand dollars. So it was a lot of money for a 23 year old, but nothing that was going to you know, sustain me the rest of my life. And my mindset was like, all right, I'm hopefully going to play this year, but I don't know what the rest of it's going to look like. So as soon as I got in the NFL, instead of using that signing bonus to buy a car or get a lavish, you know, apartment, because I, I was drafted by the New York Giants, I got a, I got a fairly affordable apartment uh, not too far from our facility. And I brought out my, my uh, high school and college car, which was a 2005 Kia Sorento. So that's what I drove around. And, you know, it's a humbling feeling when you're walking into, uh, driving into, you know, the facility and you're seeing Rolls Royces, Lamborghinis, you know, Mercedes, G-Wagons, all kinds of vehicles. And, and I'm driving in with my 2005 Kia Sorento. But, um, you know, it was the first taste of like, all right. I want some nice things, but I'm gonna. I believe in delayed gratification, and I want to make sure I set myself up before I start to buy those things. Now that had to have been hard, though, seeing all that, <laughs> and then not kind of just spending all that you had. Did you deal with that? Did you struggle with that for the first couple of years? Well, I would say one thing 
that I, I say a lot is people say, like, don't let your spending increase. Like, oh, you start making way more money and keep your spending the same. And in, cons- in theory, that is amazing. In actuality, it's a bunch of baloney, if you ask me. I I think it's unrealistic to a degree. And a great example is I was in college living, after all my bills were paid, living off of 300, somewhere between three and $500 a month and just making it work. That's all I had to spend once my once my rent was paid. And then I get into the NFL and I, my mindset was like, I'm all, like, after my, after I paid my, um, my, like, well, my car was already paid for, my parents bought it, but my rent and all of my expenses, I'm only going to have a thousand dollars. That's all I'm going to spend a month. And every month I blew that out of the water because I was living in New York. So, all right, you, you try to fly back home to visit my family. That's a few hundred dollars right there. You go to a dinner in New York City. That's a few hundred dollars right there. And so that it gets ate up really quickly. And I started to realize, although I was living off, let's call it $300 a month in college. And I considered myself a very frugal person. I'm driving in 2005 Kia Sorento to say I was only going to spend a thousand dollars a month was, was extremely unrealistic now I still think I still believe I spent a lot less money than a lot of my peers around me but um I'm always very wary of like the financial literacy and and uh savers of the world who say oh live off of forty thousand dollars even when you even when your income goes to one hundred and fifty thousand. and you know there's there's it, the concept is very good but I've learned in in actuality you go to a you go to a nice restaurant and you might order the Wagyu steak instead of the, you know, New York strip. Like you're, you're gonna do it when you know you, you you know you have it sometimes. And as long as you're doing that sparingly, I think that's what's important. Yeah, well, you, you've told the story about the rookie dinner. I've heard that a few times, uh, talking about tempting to spend more. Tell us about that rookie dinner and, and what happened. All right. So for those of the p- listeners out there who don't know, in the NFL is like it's kind of a part of the culture. The rookie at some point you go to dinner with your position group. So that's usually between between five to 10 guys, depending on what your position is. And they're ordering the most expensive steak. So we're just messing around. I mentioned the Wagyu. They're definitely ordering the Wagyu steak and the expensive wines and the expensive liquor and, you know, just doing it up. Well, it was my time. It was the end of the season. And there was one other rookie with me, um, but he wasn't drafted. He was a free agent. So our agreement was I'll pay three fourths of the bill. He was going to pay one fourth. And, um, you know, that was the agreement. So the they threw us a curveball, though. So it was only supposed to be eight of us. That's a, well, I was a linebacker, so we had eight linebackers in my position room. But they decided that, like, everybody in our room had a girlfriend or a wife. So they had the bright idea that, all right, let's make it a, you know, date night. And everybody got to bring their significant other. And at first, I'm like, oh, that's, that sounds pretty cool. That's cool. What, you know, whatever. And then I started to think about it. I'm like, that's double the head. And then, you know, these these wives and girlfriends, they're they're even bougier sometimes than, the, than my teammates. And they want even nicer things. So I'm like, how did I get looped into 16 heads instead of eight? Like, so um, I was already kind of doomed. But we get to the dinner. They're running it up, um, ordering Louis the 13th, which at the, at the time, I haven't even didn't even know what it was. Some expensive alcohol like like $300 bottles steaks for everybody to share just just doing it up so the dinner ends and it was about uh $7,000 the bill was and I'm like <laughs> wow this is ridiculous one dinner hitting for 7,000 so I'm doing the math and I'm gonna owe like somewhere around 4,500 he's supposed to pay the rest you know I think it was like 5,000 he's supposed to pay the rest and then his car doesn't work <laughs> so I'm steaming I'm already mad about this bill but he's like because I, I texted him before, like I knew to increase the limit on my credit card and all, and all of that. I told him to do the same. Like I'm like, no excuses. You gotta, you gotta, um, you know, hold up your end of the bargain. And his card didn't work, and he's just acting like silly, like he doesn't know how to figure it out. So I end up getting stuck with the whole bill. And then you know the vets are telling me to to tip very well because you know we had a good uh, good server and all that. So the bill, all in all, with tip included, I ended up spending about ten thousand dollars. I'm <laughs> I'm walking out of there so mad you know needless to say that the, the rookie that got that was on the team that year he disappeared still haven't talked to him <laughs> and, me and him got beef if i ever see him i'm like one day i'm gonna run into him and i'll be like what the heck man like 
uh, you know, we, we definitely have a little beef there, but you know, it's, it's a part of it, but that, that was the, one of the, not, not one of the most expensive thing I did my whole rookie year was rookie dinner. And you know, I've, I've paid it for it now because I've, I've had a bunch of rookies. I just didn't finish my ninth year in the NFL. So I make sure, I make sure I, I'm on the other, other end of that. And I'm getting, I'm getting my 10 K worth every, um, every season, but, uh, it was, it was brutal in the moment. That's great. So you've gotten very familiar with Wagyu and, and Louis, Louis the 13th at this point, right? <laughs> I love it. That's cool. Well, so you you started to you continued career past rookie year. You know, you, as you just said, you're in your ninth year. Your income probably grew from that point. Talk to us about this balance of you know putting away some money, but then also being able to live your life and enjoy it. How did you start to put away the money you needed to start building this real estate empire that you have now? I would say I, I saved almost everything, and uh, you know after my rookie year was when I invested in my first property, and uh, you know I was spending you know spending some money, but I wasn't going crazy. You know, um, I was trying to be conservative and my mindset was like, man, I want to be able to live good forever, not just right now. So let me let me like make the sacrifices now and really embrace delayed gratification because, you you know, a lot of guys live it up in the moment and then struggle later on. And I didn't want that to be me. So that was my mindset. And pretty much my whole rookie contract in New York for the uh, first four years, I stayed in the same apartment. I could have lived in anybody out there in New Jersey or New York. I could have lived in Hoboken with views overlooking New York City and done all that. But I stayed in a small town called Secaucus. It was less than 10 minutes away from the practice facility. And I had a little two bedroom apartment and uh, you know, I just I just handled business that way for my whole rookie deal and was saving money, figuring out what to do with it. And I started began investing in into real estate because I, I realized that that was the thing that can really change my life and taking my earned income and converting it into investments. And then those investments create cash flow. And that cash flow is what I can then live off of. So kind of believing in getting that momentum started to where one day I would be where I'm at now and, and have enough passive income to sustain my lifestyle. I love it. Why, why real estate investing? Why did you choose that path versus, I don't know, putting a bunch of money in the stock market or maybe starting a small business of your own? Why did real estate uh, call to you? I'll say, so with the stock market, my issue with it, even to this day, is there's no cash flow and it's all speculation. It's going to go up over a long period of time. That's great. I know it works if you do it right. Index funds, the whole, you know, the whole spill that you always hear. And I got like retirement accounts that has, you know, that's in the stock market. But I'm like, what about the guy who retires and needs cash flow now and needs money to live off of? And if I'm going to retire in the next few years and I don't have any income coming in, well, what if it's 2022 and I need, let's call it $100,000 to sustain my lifestyle, but my stocks went down. So I'm actually drawing I'm, and I'm hurting my, my position because I need $100,000 to live, but my stocks are down. Like, so that, that math and playing that game year in and year out, I didn't like it. So that's why I dib dibbled and dabbled in the stock market, but it was like, it just didn't feel for, for me. And then businesses, I think creating a business and it can create cash flow. you know, you own it, all that is great, but it's, it's active. Like you got to work and it, there's no guarantee that it's going to work out. And it takes a lot of time intensive. So my, my mindset and my like mentality where I, what I started to build in is what I call the trifecta and any investment I could consider, I really want to hit three things. One, it needs to be passive because I don't want to give myself another job personally. So that's number one. Number two, it needs to have cash flow because I want to hit my TMI and TMI is target monthly income. I, um, so if I want to get to my target monthly income, which, you know, mine's different than yours, whatever, everyone needs to figure that number out. But if I want to get that, then every investment I get into needs to be moving me down the field, so to speak towards my um, TMI, my target monthly income. So it needs to cash flow. And number three, it needs to appreciate. So if I'm investing $100,000 today, hopefully in two years, three years, five years, et cetera, then it's gonna you know, give me more. It's gonna be worth much more than the $100,000. So as I lo looked at a lot of different investments, stock market to me, I know there are ways, there's dividend stocks and there's different things that you can do to get to get uh, cash flow from stock. But to me, stock market didn't really address all three. And to me, starting a business didn't address all three because it wasn't really passive. So, but real estate did. There's ways to invest in real estate 
that hits all three. And I think anybody who has a nine to five job out there is working and, and stuff starts to look at it that way. And I'm not saying you can never like uh, the trifecta is what I really want, but there's times where it might be, you might be willing to have two of the three or, or, um, but I've never really liked doing anything. That's only one of the three. You need at least two of the three in any situation. But for me, I like to do get into investments that I'm hitting all three and I developed that mindset. And, and then I, it just real estate kept pulling on me where it's like, it solves the issues that I think need to be solved. I, I couldn't agree with you more. If you have a shorter career standpoint or you want early retirement, having that cash flow sooner than later is going to help you out. And real estate definitely beats out stock investing when it comes to that stuff. Stocks are great for long-term appreciation and then can provide you the income down the road. But if you want that early retirement, or in your case, like, hey, I've, I've maybe got 10 years doing this, or I maybe got three years. What is the average for the NFL player? Three, three years, three and a half years, something like that? Three and a half, three years. And a half years. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and I think, I, think that's, I think that's really important for people to know what their goals are. Because are you just trying to, is your goal really to, you know, retire in your 60s and you just want to have enough money in the bank then maybe just stock market and letting it ride and sit. But if you're a person who is interested in financial freedom, who is interested, because the thing is, even for the person who might have that objective of like, I'm okay working until I'm 60. Like, I love what I do. I, I can't imagine not working. Well, okay, but you wouldn't like some income coming in outside of your day job that is generated and like you would not get into to the point like I would say right now is the most freeing I've ever felt because I'm now in a position to where I play in the NFL because I love the game and I want to play not because I feel like I need to play to sustain my lifestyle to make more money like the money is great but I'm not I don't have to play for that anymore because I know that I have an, I've reached my TMI and you know so I will be able to sustain my lifestyle even without the NFL so I now I get to play because I want to not because I need to or have to so I would explain explore everyone out there, even if you are a person who are okay with the traditional form of retiring in your 60s, like work because you want to, not because you have to. And you could do that when you invest with cash flow in mind and passive investing and reaching your TMI. So that's kind of my uh, my, my uh, pitch. I love it. I love it, man. And, and, and as you're talking about the first uh, level that you spoke about at being passive, now a lot of people look at real estate and they say, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work too. That might be like a business for me. Talk to the people who are, are thinking that and, and I guess how do you keep it passive so it it could be something you do when you're an NFL player as well. <laughs> okay, so there there's three ways that you can invest in real estate passive that I've done. I, there's many different ways that you can do it, but and then I'll, I'll throw in a bonus one at, at the end as well. But number one is you invest in real estate in markets where you have your core four. So that's your real estate agent, your lender, a contractor and a handyman, and a property management team. If you have those core four, then you can invest passively in a, in a market. So therefore, and when I say passive, I don't mean like kick your feet up and do absolutely nothing. Like, come on people, let's not be lazy here. But passive in the sense of we're talking about hours in a month, not days in a month. You can manage a real estate portfolio in five hours or less in the whole month. I consider that passively. Maybe some people would say that's still active, but to me, if I just need to look over statements and oversee my property management and make sure the numbers make sense and match up what hit my bank account, which with a caveat, you can have a bookkeeper or your accountant do. So it can become, even, even that part can become passive. But like that's not that intensive in of work. So when you can have those four pieces, your core four, I think that's how what makes it passive. So you can do that in commercial real estate, residential real estate, multifamily, like across the board, you just need the pieces in place to where you're not the one slugging and getting the work done over and over and over again. So that's the first way. The second way is real estate syndications. And this is what the caveat of, in most cases, you need to become an accredited investor. So you need to have between a husband and wife, I know this is a marriage show, so husband and wife need to bring in $200,000 or more a couple or have a net worth of a million. But if you fit that, or if you have aspirations of fitting that, you can invest in syndications and just a standard syndication that I'm in, you get an 8% preferred return. So however much money you're in, you get 8% return annually. And most of the syndications I'm in pay out dividends quarterly. So eight, so that's 2% a quarter. And then at the end, when they sell or refinance the property that the syndication that you invested in, 
then you get to uh, participate in the sale and at a 70-30 split to the investors that invested. So you get your principal back, an 8% preferred return, and a piece of the upside. And all you have to do is your due diligence up front. You're obviously making sure the person running the deal is legit, making sure you agree with the numbers, the property, et cetera, et cetera. But you do all the work up front, and then you get statements, you get communication from that team, so you know what everything is going on, and you just get to kick back and get that. So that's number two. And then number three is short-term lending. If you're a person who has capital, I've done a couple of short-term lending, double-digit double digit interest rates, you know, for a year or less. So, you know, you're talking on $100,000, 15%, making $15,000 every year on, a, on $100,000. That's a great return on your money. And the collateral can be real estate. So, you know, if somebody's flipping a 10 plex in your, in your you know, city and you're lending some money, you can lend them some money and they pay a high interest rate because getting the money from you is faster than a bank and it's short term. So, um, it, so they're winning because they're getting the capital fast and you're winning because you're getting a high interest rate. And the collateral, if everything falls apart, is your, uh, you get stake in the actual property. So those are three ways that I've invested passively. And, it, and they all take some work up front and a little bit of management along the way, but it is very passive in my opinion. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and obviously you were making a, a, a good income during this nine year period of stretch of time. How, how much of that do you think you were saving in order to get these? I think you said 50 properties. Is that right? At this point, how, how much were you? Yeah, so I own, I, I own 30, 30 uh, properties on my own and then I'm in over 30 syndications. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in 60 plus real estate deals right now. You know, I never really paid attention exactly to what I'm saving, what, I, um, what I'm not. I just tried to live very lean. Like, let me, and the way that I do that is I pick my vices. And I recommend this to, to everyone out there. You can't be a travel guy, a restaurant guy, a jewelry guy, a party guy, an expensive house guy, a car guy. That's how you go broke. So for me, I was like, what, what do I value? I value traveling. And so, you know, I like I like to travel. I travel out of the country, within the States. And, and so that's something. And I value, you know, a nice dinner and stuff. I'm getting older, so I'm not in the clubs and partying and all that. Married, two kids, all that. So I enjoy having a nice dinner with my wife or going with a couple of buddies, going to a nice restaurant. So those are the things that I value a lot. So I'll spend money there. But I cut back on a lot of the other things. I'm not you're not gonna see me with a bunch of gold chains on and and you know two or three blinged out houses that are aren't investments, they're just my properties. Like I you know, I'm not doing those type of things because um I've recognized what I value and that's how I've been able to keep keep my spending down. And uh, you know, the next thing is managing my fixed expenses. So, so many people get caught up in variable expenses. And what I mean by fixed first variable, fixed expenses are, is the number one thing that stops people from reaching financial freedom. So let's go through this. What are your fixed expenses? Where you live, so either you're, where you're paying rent or your mortgage, education, so the student loan debt, how much you're paying for school, transportation, Everybody wants the nice Hellcat vehicle or, or Range Rover or, or Mercedes, etc. And then bad debt. So those are things that you buy and you got to pay month in and month out. They're fixed expenses. If you can keep those down, then your monthly expenses are going to stay down. And then you don't have to be penny pinching every second to get for the latte. Like, you know, I have, I have so many people like cut back on the lattes and I'm like, cut back on your mortgage. Yeah. Like just because you get pre-approved for a five hundred thousand dollar loan doesn't mean you need to buy a five hundred thousand dollar property. Why don't you get a three hundred thousand dollar property, a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar property? I'm telling you that will make that will impact your like lifespan and your your reaching financial freedom much more than the six dollar latte from Starbucks. And some people are not gonna want to hear that, but it's the truth. And same with student loan debt. Same with cars. You like, you know, the guys out there that's getting the huge pickup trucks. That's eighty thousand dollars. Do you really? Do you really need it? And you're paying dang near a mortgage on your on your car every month because you want to have the great pickup truck. Like, could you downsize and get a more affordable car or get one used and you know do things th that way? So I would say minimize your fixed expenses so you can. Um, so you don't have to worry about the variable expenses that, as much. So I've always kept my fixed expenses down. 
to where some of the variable things I don't worry about as much. I, I like sneakers, so I'll buy a, a nice pair of shoes here and there because I don't think $100 is going to kill me when my mortgage is low, when I'm not overpaying for vehicles and, and things like that. So I think that along the way of my in my career, that's what I focused on to manage my expenses and save majority of what I burn. I think that's great. Yeah. I mean if you can if you can clobber the big things, the small things don't even really matter. I mean it's such a small amount of money. And if it brings you so much joy, why are you killing your joy first when you could be attacking these other things that make such a a bigger impact. You know, uh, uh, pe people are listening right now and they say, okay, you know what? I, I have decent income, but I'm spending most of it and I, I want to move in this direction. What is one small step they could take to use some of this earned income, this active income that they're doing to move towards a passive income lifestyle? What's one step that we could leave, them, leave with them following this interview? I would say the number one thing is maximize your earning potential by adding value to yourself. You know, we're in an ever-changing world. So you're either getting better or you're getting worse. You never stay the same. So I see so many people um, in all walks of life getting comfortable in the position they're in and however much their salary is and like, oh, every 10 years I'm gonna get a raise and just kind of coasting. And when you're living your life that way, it's you're making it harder. You're, you're trudging along. If you are intentional about adding value to yourself, then you're gonna eventually be able to ask for more income at your job, getting another job. If you're an entrepreneur, whatever walk of life you're in, from the plumber to the CEO, if you are adding value to yourself and increasing your skill set, your abilities, your um, what you're capable of doing, then you can widen the spread between what you spend and what you make. And once again, so many people get stuck on. The, the spend and cutting back on the lattes, like I mentioned before. And it's like, that can move the needle just a little bit. But getting really good at a certain skill set can take you here to here. So my thing is lock in on your fixed expenses, minimizing that, and then double down on adding value to yourself so you can increase your revenue and widen this gap. And then that's what's going to give you room to invest. Devon, this is great. This is great advice. It's inspiring. And I know you have this all in a nice book. So tell people about the book and where people they, where, where they can get it. Go to my website, D-E-V-O-N-K-E-N-N-A-R-D. It's my name, Devon Kennard. And you can pre-order the book now. It comes out in April, mid-April. So please pre-order it now. And, you know, I appreciate the support. And, you know, I talk I talk about all, everything we're talking about now, moving down the moving down the field toward financial freedom. And, you know, everything, it all adds up every little bit, every decision you make, every move you make. It moves you down the football field until you score. And the nice thing is after you score, you can go score again. And again, you're going back and forth down the field and climbing up the ladder of reaching financial freedom and success for yourself. So make sure you go pre-order the book. Uh, I think it could change and impact a lot of lives. I love it. it, it the, the book says itself, everybody. It all adds up. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.